last minute chemistry top tips. Right, obviously there are the usual rules of just, you know, knowing your spec and learning your answers nice and precisely. But I just want to touch on some bits of the specification that get totally ignored. So halogen displacement reactions is one of those topics, in my opinion. Remember here, a more reactive halogen displaces a less reactive halogen from its compound. And then in terms of that group seven halogen order, at the top of the group, we have fluorine, then we have chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine. So being the top of the group, fluorine is the most reactive. And then that reactivity decreases down the group. So obviously make sure you obey that when we consider the fact that a more reactive halogen displaces a less reactive halogen from its compound. So you could, if they're being really mean, you could be asked to plan an investigation which proves the halogen order of reactivity. So for example, if you're given chlorine, bromine and iodine, how do you determine the reactivity? Well, first of all, react chlorine either suggests potassium or sodium salt. So for example, react chlorine with potassium bromide. You can write it out in words if you prefer. Because the chlorine is more reactive than bromine, the bromine will be displaced. And really, you should be practicing writing your balanced symbol equations for this reaction. So you take your chlorine, you react it with your potassium bromide to form bromine and potassium chloride. Make sure it gets balanced. There's always loads of marks for that. And then in terms of what you'd see, you'd see a orange solution due to that bromine being produced. What about this time if you're reacting chlorine with potassium iodide? The iodine will be displaced because it's less reactive. So very similar situation. You'll have chlorine reacting with potassium iodide to form iodine and potassium chloride. Get it balanced. And then what will you see this time? You'll see a brown solution. So you don't have to write a lot, but you do need to be prepared to draw this equation and state any observations. Remember, observations is saying what you see. To prove that bromine is more reactive than iodine, so this time we're reacting bromine with potassium iodide, the iodine will be displaced according to the following equation. And again, due to that formation of the iodine, you'd expect to see a brown solution. All halogens are diatomic, which means they consist of two atoms, such as fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Their melting points increase down the group and they get darker in color down the group. So remember, we'll have a yellow gas, green gas, orange liquid, gray solid, black solid, and iodine undergoes sublimation, which means it turns directly from a solid to a gas. Another topic I want to touch on is making salts, such as copper sulfate. So be prepared to write a very detailed method here, as well as draw a diagram. So I'll just remind you what happens. There's our beaker. We're gonna add copper oxide to sulfuric acid. The copper oxide needs to be in excess. Sometimes they want you to be very specific with apparatus, so we're going to use a stirring rod to mix. Because we need to remove any unreacted copper oxide, we're going to use a funnel with filter paper. 
There's your unreacted copper oxide. And down here is your saturated copper sulfate solution. Feel free to write out in full. So we're going to filter to remove unreacted copper oxide. And then because we probably want to make a dry crystal, they'll be quite specific in the exam. There's my evaporating basin, my saturated copper sulfate solution. Here's my tripod and there's my Bunsen burner. Make sure you can draw these diagrams nice and accurately in a scientific way. I don't want any 3D diagrams in chemistry. So we're saying in step five, heat to evaporate some of the water. Leave to cool and dry and be specific with that drying. I'm going to say in a drying oven or you could say on a warm shelf. But that's how I'm going to guarantee myself five, six marks here. Obviously, I could just go through the whole spec here. It's all really important. But I do want you to make sure you spend time learning the salt solubility rules. Remember, that's all in my SWH learning revision guide. But, you know, the rules such as all nitrates are soluble, all potassium, sodium and ammonium salts are soluble. And be prepared to point out any of those salts which are insoluble. You must learn those rules because you can't just guess it. I mean, you'll have a 50-50 chance, but I do think it's worth looking at. I want to remind you quickly of, you know, reacting mass calculations. Look, it's worth four marks. It comes up so often. Remember, you're going to repeat the equation that they give you in the question. You're going to set yourself up by drawing that formula triangle. Then you're going to write mass, MR, number of moles for your working. We're being asked to find the maximum mass in tons of nitric acid. Acids are H plus donors. So you are looking for something which contains H plus ions as being your acid. So we're after this mass here. We've been told that we have 11.5 tons of nitrogen dioxide. I don't need to sort out the units because my final answer is in tons. They've only put that there to confuse you. Do not allow them to confuse you. The MR now, we just do 14 plus two lots of oxygen to get 46. Remember when calculating the MR, you mustn't include that three. Then we find the number of moles by doing mass divided by MR. So we do 11.5 divided by 46 to get 0 0.25. Check the mole connection, it's three to two. So you can't just steal that number directly. You have to divide it by that three and then times it by the two and you're allowed to take across that number of moles. Don't round too soon in these answers because the numbers are already small and you'll introduce rounding errors. Now the MR of nitric acid, remember we ignore that two so we do 1 plus 14 plus 3 lots of oxygen to get 63. And then our final step is to find the mass, which we do MR times number of moles to get 10.5. Remember, my all-in-one video has loads of different mole calculations, but I just wanted to show you that one. Remember, you can use that table with so many different questions such as this empirical formula one, I'm just gonna show you that it works here too. So if in doubt, even if you're not sure, do just try and find number of moles somewhere. That will definitely get you some marks. So what's our mass? Just be careful because these are all proportional, you're allowed to steal the percentages as being your mass. Don't let that confuse you. Then use your periodic table to find the relative atomic masses. Number of moles is 38.7 divided by 12. And then divide by the smallest number. So look at these numbers. What's the smallest number? So your ratio becomes 1 to 3 to 1. So our final answer here, don't forget to write it, is CH3O. And then just to show you what to do, if they ask you to find the relative molecular mass, they've told us it's 62. All you have to do is find the MR of what you just worked out. which is 31, and then just divide the number they've given you by that MR to get two. So your molecular formula, because remember that's the actual number of atoms of each element present, will just be two lots of 
this. So our final answer is C2H6O2.